here in this event of your lifetime. It, I think it's great. And why not? We got Ken Gerard coming on on top of the hour, you know, talking about cryptic. So I figured tonight's a good night to break it. Anyway, we'll be back in about two and a half minutes. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio After Dark. I'm Gary, and that is James uh, eating his sugar frosted flakes, which he ran to the store today physically ran and got some sugar frosted flakes or he wouldn't be out we'll be back in two and a half you're listening to night dreams Life's journey some ask themselves why the big time is passing by. They want it all and they want it now. No need to wonder how or why. They decide to make a connection with the bearer of life from the other side. It's a self-centered new world reflection. It's a one-way ticket for a hell of a ride. They're making a deal. Whether down at the crossroads or Hollywood and line, they're making a deal. Gonna have it all for a moment in time. Kingpin drug dealer who wants the competition out of the way. You may be an elite politician who wants total control and a power play. You may be an aspiring entertainer who wants to have the name in lights. You may be a four star general who wants the upper hand in a global fight. They're all making a deal. With the chief light bearer from the other side, they're making a deal. It's an alternative thing for one hell of a ride. You can advertise your business on Night Dreams Talk Radio and you will be heard worldwide. Why not contact us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. You are listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio Network from our compound to you worldwide with your host, Gary Anderson. That is me. Wow. What can I say? And I say we got a great show coming at the top of the hour. We're going to be talking about cryptics with the one and only Ken Gerard, who's been on numerous, numerous TV shows, uh, you know, talking cryptics. James, are you still here? Don't tell me we lost James. No, I'm still here. I, I couldn't get the mute button off. They ignore it. Wow. Gee, <laughs> buy yourself a better <laughs> mic. No, never mind. Anyway, it's not the mic, it was the mouth. Oh, oh well, I'm oh. here. Anyway, again, I think we're going to have a great show later tonight. Now, I want to talk to you, everybody, about, well, cryptics. In my case, Bigfoot. Now, in the early, I think it was like 2001 ish, uh, me and my friend, uh, who was a medical doctor, just finished his internship. And he was in the process of opening up in Washington state, a practice, medical practice. And me and him at that time, I, I took a break, James from, you know, radio. I got burned out on radio. You know, I wanted something a little bit more secure. I was offered a job of managing three professional camera stores. 
And I figured, oh, why not? You know, uh, I've done a lot of radio sales in the past, too. So I figured, hey, I can manage this with my background of, you know, a photography also as a major hobby and professionally in my life also. So, you know, we would go up down the Washington, Oregon coast, California, you know, doing lighthouses, finding old ghost towns and taking pictures. And we figured, you know what, we want to go somewhere special. And we figured we want to go up to the Canadian Rockies and take pictures of old ghost towns, old silver mines, old cemeteries. And one place we wanted to get to so bad was a World War II internment camp where they would, uh, Canada would hold Japanese prisoners from World War II. They would intern them into this camp miles and miles away from nowhere. So if a, a prisoner ran away, he, he would be out in the middle of the woods, which he wouldn't survive, depending on the time of year. I mean, there's a lot of bears out there that would like to eat anybody that's running around. Uh, and you really were secluded, especially back in the, the 40s. Anyway, we decided, you know, that was one of the places we were going to stop to. And, uh, you know, we got some beautiful pictures of some, you know, what was left of ghost towns, uh, silver mines, really beautiful up in the Canadian Rockies. You'd be looking on these, you know, mountains, sides of mountains, and you'd see caves. And these caves were where they were mining for silver. And you sit there and look at it and you go, wow, how did they ever get up to those? Because they would be up some of them like 300 feet, 400 feet above ground on a side of a mountain that's virtually vertical. And I don't know how they managed to do it. How do they would get the equipment in there? How they would, you know, do what they did. But that itself was amazing. And you saw a lot of them. You also saw a lot of cemeteries in all those areas because a lot of the labor that worked in these mines were Chinese and the life expectancy was not very long working in the mine. I mean, because of cave-ins and probably falling off the side of the mountain, getting into the caves. So anyway, we finally get to where we're going. And I remember it was all wooded. We took off the main road, which wasn't, you know, a super highway it was still snow on the ground, and this is like the beginning of June, and it was uh, cold, or, you know, not really cold, but cold, where you still had to wear a jacket, and you could see your breath, I remember that, and we had to go off some side road, which wasn't much of a road left anymore, but we went in as far as we could, and then we had to hike in to get where we were going. And I remember hiking in and we ran across a cemetery. It was so cool. And the cemetery, I think the, the, the like, it was like 1880s, 1870s, 1860s. You know, a lot of the tombstones were still there, gr- overgrown like you wouldn't believe because who goes there? And then we also ran into the Japanese uh, prisoner of war camp uh, uh, cemetery. And I don't know if the bodies were ever, you know, returned to Japan after the war. I have no idea. But there were still some markers there. Again, totally overgrown. And then we had uh, maybe another mile go into what was left of the camp. And it was really nothing left of the camp anymore. There was a, a bunch of, like, machinery, old machinery. And I remember there was a crick. Uh, going, well, a little bit bigger than a creek, but not a river. And, and maybe it's what they call it. No, it's bigger than a stream anyway. And it was between what was the internment camp and a silver mine it was right there at the base of the camp. And I remember, you know, I was in so awe of, you know, the beauty of all this. And, and then I started thinking about all the anguish, you know, of the prisoners, what they had to go through and all that stuff. But my friend says, look at that bear across the, you know, by the mine, you know, across the creek. And I remember I had a telephoto lens on my camera and I, you know, I put it up to my eye to look and I figured, oh, I'll get a picture of a bear. I'm telling you, James, it was not a bear. Oh, my goodness. You must have been in like uh, shock and awe so much so that you didn't even... um fire off any pictures, I bet. 
No, I and because what happened is I had a, what they call a 2.8, I think it was like a 200 or 300 mil. It was a 300 millimeter 2.8 lens, which had a lot of glass. And I don't know if the reflection, uh, you know, of the sun, uh, you know, reflected onto whatever it was. But about the same time I saw it, it saw me. Okay. And I remember the scream. And it was like the most scariest scream I've ever heard. And top it all off, because it was on the base of the mountain there, it echoed. Oh, okay. Boy. And, you know, uh, my friend and I were looking at what it, what it was. And, and I remember saying to my friend, I said, hey, this is not a bear. And right about then, it decides to come after us. Now, the thing started out. It was standing there on two legs, not on four legs. When we saw it, I can tell you this, it had long arms it, that uh, probably if you would, you know, add maybe a foot onto your arms, that, that tells you roughly how long the arms were. And right. That's, that's, that sounds a lot like a primate. They got usually longer arms. So yeah. Okay. And it, it was hairy and it was like a dark, of course, I'm colorblind, but I can tell you this, it was a dark, brown okay it was almost uh, into the the black scale and how wide i was gonna say how wide was it like from shoulder to shoulder uh put it this way arnold would be a, a dwarf uh compared oh, wow. to it. Uh, it it was big it probably weighed i would say somewhere in the five plus hundred pound range and what seven eight foot tall now i would say in the, about the eight footish plus range wow now what i saw and i only saw it for a minute i have never really described what the face looked like it looked humanoid but not humanoid it had his face was probably about 80 percent hair it had a little bit of skin on the forehead it had uh what i remember when i glanced through the the the, uh, telephoto lens it the nose looked like if you took somebody's nose and punched it and flattened it, kind of. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it didn't have a humanoid nose. Right. And, and the face was broad and bigger than uh, a human's face. So the head was probably absolutely big, too. Yeah, that's and, what uh, I'm saying. And I couldn't see any ears because the amount of hair was on it. Uh, I can honestly tell you that's about all I ever saw of it, uh, other than when I turned around a few times. It came after us. And oh, like my. I said, that scream, put it this way, scared me more than anything. I was in the military. I, I, I went through some bad shit in my life in the military uh, in the, the 70s. And I can tell you this, it it. it it was the most scariest thing I have ever gone through in my whole entire life. Wow. What was the, um, somebody just asked, what was the shape of the head roughly? Uh, you know, if you look at a pre caveman, basically the head, the forehead was wide. The whole, the face was wide. You know, I other I, like I said, I, I only glanced at it for a very short time. I'm not going to lie yeah. to the listeners and start making up stuff. Okay, I, I, right. I can't do that. I, right. I, but I can tell you, it wasn't a human face, but it was not a face of a gorilla. Put it that way, because it did have a little bit of skin on the forehead. It, it had big eyes, you know, glaring big eyes. I noticed that. Again, I didn't mm-hmm. notice any ears. I didn't notice any, you know, uh, mouth features or anything like that. Uh, right. But if you could imagine that scream uh, echoing and, and as loud as it was, I, I've never heard anything like that. Now, that, uh, that must have rattled you to the core when that, that scream. Jeez. I remember, you know, I, I was so proud of myself. I think I peed my pants once in, in kindergarten, you know, and the embarrassment of having that happen and my mom bringing other pants to school if I could change. Uh, you know, I never had an accident, even over in the military. I never had an accident. 
I, I wet myself. I, I was so scared. I just couldn't hold it. I, it was just, you wouldn't believe the trauma it was. My friend, again, who, you know, had to, you know, 